Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to those of you who are online this morning. It's a wonderful day to be alive, and I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to join you this morning. I want to recognize two individuals who I am seeing online, uh, Pastor Barwise. It's good to have you online this morning. Pastor Barwise was one of my administrators while I served there in East Jamaica Conference. And I am also seeing my good friend and colleague in the seminary, Pastor Floyd, Floyd Green. And um, I'm grateful for your presence with us this morning. And I trust that as we share together this morning, our hearts will be lifted up and we will be closer drawn to Jesus Christ. I want to again read for you uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 as we get into the word. For the grace of God has appeared, and I'm reading for from the NIV, that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for having brought us together on this platform we thank you, Lord, that you have been good to us and your grace continues to abound. We ask you that you will speak through us, through me now to your people. And may we all be blessed and may we be close and drawn to you, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. The epiphany of grace, the basis for the Christian conduct described in the preceding verses is grounded theologically in the saving epiphany of God. Verse 11, the scripture reading that forms the sermonic portion this morning is opened with the Greek word God, which is translated for or because in the English Bible, gar can be used simply as a conjunction or a logical explanatory conjunction or an explanatory conjunction. In this instance, gar is used as a logical explanatory conjunction which indicates that additional information is to follow with respect to what is being described. In contrast to the teachers of heresy, Paul admonished Titus in the preceding 10 verses to teach the things that become sound doctrine. He sketches out the various groups within the church and encourage Titus to give attention to them. In verse 2, Paul told Titus to teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, to have self-control, to be sound in the faith, love, and endurance. In verses 3 to 5, he was to teach the older women to be reverent, in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to wine, but to teach what is good, to encourage the younger women to love their husbands and children, to have self-control, to be pure and busy at home, to be kind and be subjected to their husband. And Paul gave the reason for it. He says, that no one will malign the word of God. In verses 6 through 8, he told Titus to encourage the young men to control themselves. 
And in verses 9 and 10, he spoke about how slaves were to be taught to behave towards their masters. Having said all of that, Paul made a transition in verse 11 by using the logical explanatory conjunction, God. In telling them about the power by which they could do all these. He said to them for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Biblical scholars posit that. There are at least 19 different kinds of grace. There is what is called common grace. It's the kind of grace that is given to all humanity regardless of their religious beliefs. This type of grace is universally experienced and isn't dependent on faith. The Bible says that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, highlighting the impartial distribution of common grace. Then there is pervenial grace. This is seen as the grace that works in people's lives before they are aware of it or acknowledge it. It's the grace that precedes human decision, preparing and enabling them to respond to God's call of salvation. Sufficient grace embodies the belief that God's grace is sufficient for salvation and moral living. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, Paul, a God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. It communicates the fact that God's support is all-encompassing, providing strength and sustenance in all situations. Saving grace is the grace that brings salvation to sinners. It is through this grace that individuals are saved from sin and eternal condemnation. It highlights the fact that salvation is free. It is a free gift from God, not something that can be earned through uh, good deeds and pilgrimage. Then there is what is called enabling grace, which provides believers with the strength and capability to live righteously and godly. It is through this grace that individuals are empowered to become, to overcome rather, sin and its consequences and live a life pleasing to God. We know about sanctifying grace. We know about justifying grace. We know about sustaining grace, the kind of grace that supports and sustains believers through trials and tribulations through turmoils and tests, through battles and bullets, through mishaps and misfortune, through pressures and plight. It is the grace that strengthens faith and fosters perseverance, enabling believers to endure hardships and maintain their faith and trust in God. And there is provisional grace which refers to the grace provided by God to meet the needs of his people. It is the provision uh, and support extended to believers to navigate through life's challenges and difficulties. And yet I have not exhausted the various graces. Beloved, it was not uncommon for pagans to use the term grace to signify divine and regal beneficence. Something good done by a god or a king for those who could not do for themselves. Aristotle, the great philosopher, defining grace stresses the very point that it is conferred freely with no expectation of return. And finding its only motive in the bounty and free 
uh, heartedness of the giver. In pagan Greece, this favor was always conferred upon a friend, not upon an enemy. Let me say that again. Grace. In pagan Greece, as they understood it, was always conferred on a friend and not an enemy. But in the terminology of the New Testament, it takes on an infinite leap. And acquires an added meaning which it never had in pagan Greece. For beloved, you and I should understand that the favor God did for us on Calvary's cross. He did not for a race that loved him. Not for a race that appreciated him. Not for a race that embraced him. But he did it for a race that hated him. And despised him. The Bible says God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22. Paul says you. Referring to you and I online this morning. You referring to all who have accepted Christ. You referring to those who will accept Christ. You were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now as he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreproachable in his sight. The problem with some of us, including this preacher this morning, is that we sometimes dress ourselves in pseudo-spirituality and we act as if we fell from heaven with lily-white wings. And that's everything is ever so wonderful about us. But can I tell you this morning that we can fool God because all of us need a touch of mercy. All of us need a touch of grace. All of us have said the wrong words. All of us have gone to the wrong places. All of us have hooked up with the wrong people. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Let me tell you this morning, as I remind myself that we were wicked, we were evil, we were ungodly, we were brutish, we were dirty, we were sinful, and we were going to hell, and we were going in stylish manner. But thank God for grace. Thank God grace made a difference. Thank God he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And now we have been born again. Now we have been washed. Now we have been sanctified. Now we have been made holy. Now we have been set apart. Now we are called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Now we are God's epistle being read by all men. And Paul made it clear when he declared, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Thank God for his grace. Grace did it. Some of you are wondering how comes you are still alive. So long after the doctor told you. You only have a month to live. Grace did it. Some of you are amazed. How you got that promotion. When you had oppositions on every side. Grace did it. Some of you are still wondering. How comes your children are not pushing dope in their veins after they had gone through so much depression. Grace did it. It's cause grace. Grace did it. It's grace. Grace. 
God's grace. Grace that exceeds our sins and our guilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. An Indian who had been led to Jesus was once asked what he had done to become a Christian. I did nothing he said. Well, tell us how did it happen? How was your life changed? I can't fully explain it, but I can demonstrate what happened, the Indian replied. With that, the Indian took some small dry sticks and with them he made a circle around a Rope worm hole. Then he asked one of them to light a match and set the sticks on fire. Soon the worm came out of the hole and seemed not to know what to do, for in every direction it turned, there was fire. The Indian put forth his hand in the circle. But the worm would not crawl on it. And as the fire grew hotter and hotter, the worm crawled in every direction and with each time returned to its hole. Finding no outlet, no way of escape from the flame, at last it seemed to have found out that it could not save itself. For it now remained quiet, still in the center of the circle. While the fire became intense, at last, the last moment came. Before the fire finally engulfed it, the Indian put out his hand and lifted the worm out of the burning circle and placed it safely on the ground far away from the danger. Now said the Indian, I was that worm. I could not get out of the fire of sin. I crawled in every direction, but I could not save myself. But Jesus lifted me out of the fire of sin and set me down in a safe place. May I tell you this morning, brothers and sisters, all of us were like that worm. The fire of sin was about to engulf us, but Jesus reached down his hand and he stretched his hand into the fire, became wounded and, and bruised. He picked us up and he turned us around and set us in a safe place. I don't know about you, but when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and what he has done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. For I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Sinking deeply, staying within, sinking to rise no more. But then the master of the sea, he heard my the spirit cry. And from the water, he lifted me, no safe am I, grace did it. And somebody ought to know that through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come to grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. And now we can lift our voices this morning and sing in praise and thanksgiving and adoration and declare amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Thank God for amazing grace. Grace is still available. Grace still abounds. 
Paul says, ah, where sin abound, grace much more abounds. Grace, my brothers and sisters, refers to an act that is beyond the ordinary course of what might be expected. I don't need to remind you this morning that all we could rightfully and reasonably expect was punishment for sin. For the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is death. For the wages of sin is death. But we have been offered grace. From the judge who stepped down from his divine throne in glory. To take upon himself the guilt and penalty of human's sin. Thus satisfying his justice and making it possible to bestow mercy on the basis of justice satisfied. Upon a hell deserving sinner who puts his faith in the savior who died for him. So that as Paul used this terminology in writing to Titus, he used it as the essence of God's covenant with humanity. It signifies God's love and God's unmerited favor. The language of verse 11 shows that this grace culminated or found full expression in Christ. And the personification results from the fact that the essential element in the epiphany is the revelation of Jesus Christ as God's gracious gift to us. The gospel then, my brothers and sisters, is not a pie in the sky, but it is for the here and now. And we are to allow it to work its effect in us. Grace teaches us how to live and not just how to exist. The same grace that saves us also trains us to live holy. God's grace does not only redeem us, but it also transforms us, reforms us, and rewards us. Believers who are honest, late, Believers who honestly understand the grace of God will not want to live in sin. Let me repeat that. Believers like you and I who honestly understand the grace of God will not want to live in sin. Paul asks, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he answered his own question by using the Greek phrase, Ukme uh, Begonito. May it never be. Certainly not, Paul said. When Ukme is used, it is always used in the indicative and always connotes that an emphatic negative is expected. It expresses a negation of the will, the wish, and the thought. So in other words, don't even begin to think. Don't let it enter your thought that grace gives license to sin. That's not one of the purposes of grace. When we are truly touched by the grace of God, we will turn from ungodliness and worldly lust. Lust for wealth, lust for pleasure, lust for power, lust for fame, or anything else that is worldly. We will live serious, clean, dedicated lives in this present world, but grace does not give us permission to sin. We will honor God with our lives. We will glorify God through the things we do. We will speak things which becometh godliness. God's grace does not only have saving power, but it also has keeping power. Paul declared now unto him that he is able to do exceedingly, 
abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I heard Jude say, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God. Our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power unto him, beloved, the burden bearer, unto him, the heavy load shearer, unto him, the problem solver, unto him, Paul Stilic, mysterium tremendum, unto him, James called God of the oppressed, unto him, called path, wally other, unto him, the uncaused cause, him, the prime mover, him, Jehovah Nisi, him, Jehovah Rapha, him, the Alpha and Omega, unto him, the heart regulator, the great emancipator, unto him, a rock in a weary land, him, a cooling shade on the burning sand, him, the faithful guide for the pilgrim's band, unto him, a bridge over troubled waters, him, the wheel in the middle of the wheel, him, my midnight song, him, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, Paul said, unto him, unto him be glory and power and majesty and might and honor and splendor and praise and wisdom and thanksgiving and blessing both now and forevermore unto him and this morning let's lift our voices in thanksgiving and thank god that is grace is mercy is love and is truth abound unto him be glory forever and ever and ever thank god for amazing grace how sweet the sound I don't know what you've been through this week, but grace has carried us all this way. I don't know what you have con what you confront, we were confronted with this week, what your troubles were, what your perplexities were, what your battles were, but you are here this morning on this platform, and it's all because of the grace of the living God. His grace has brought us safe thus far. And I want to tell you this morning as I close that his grace will lead us home. I don't know who you are this morning. If you're here on this platform, you have not yet given your heart to Christ. You have not yet made him your choice. You have not yet surrendered to him. I want to tell you this morning that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all of us and that grace is able to save you, that grace is able to transform you, that grace is able to reform you. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace. Thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. May we embrace your grace. May we embrace the salvation you have given to us. And may we be like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.